really comes in the, the category of uh, inspiring, uh, you know, inspiring people to become, uh, to take risks, to, to think big and venture out. And uh, since most of you guys are already aware of uh, Akai, let me do a plug-in for a couple of new initiatives. Uh, one is that we have a TICON coming up uh, next May, and believe it or not, planning has already started. So if you want to get involved, see, in any activity, in any aspect of, uh, of TICON as a volunteer, uh, might be a good time, say, to kind of raise your hand or talk to one of us. Let me just ask people who are here who are charter members already raise their hands. Please raise all your hands, charter members. OK, great, great. So please, uh, uh, anyone who is present here, uh, please talk to uh, any of the charter members, and they'll tell you about how to get involved. Specifically, there are two or three people that you should talk to if you're interested in doing anything with Taikong. Uh, uh, Naveen is a, is a content chair. Uh, Saurabh is, is a chair for sponsorship. So if you want to get involved, you see, you know, hone your sales skills, uh, hone your business development skills, if you can. If you want to learn the art of how to separate people from their money, uh, this is the team you see to, uh, to, to you know, join. And uh, uh, is there any other is there any other team chair? I think that's it, right? There are only two chairs. Okay, all right. Uh, so so Tycon is is one activity. The other activity that's you know just to for for your information is uh, we are starting a accelerator called Thai Launchpad, and Launchpad is uh, basically uh, we pick eight companies, high potential teams, teams of two or three people. And we give them fifty thousand uh, dollars. But most valuable is we allow those companies to pick one of their mentors from the charter member pool of, of time. And those mentors make a commitment to spend one to two hours every week with the company for five months. So that's something very very unique. And uh, if you know of your friends, if you know of uh, someone who is uh, starting a company, wants to start a company in the enterprise space, uh, please let them know. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, and the next batch is, deadline is already passed for January, but it, it gets done on a rolling basis, and the next batch will start in June. So uh, please spread the word around. Uh, other than that, you see, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, I'll just introduce the, you know, I'll introduce our, uh, our host for this evening. Uh, you know, he, he you know, all positions in in, in Thai is a volunteer position. I'm a volunteer president. I didn't I didn't introduce myself. I'm Venk Shukla, I'm president of Thai. And all the board members, all they're all volunteers. And one of those volunteers uh, who heads up the the, the program uh, position is uh, is Naveen. And it was Naveen's idea to start with this My Story program. This has been one of the most successful new programs in Thai for the last two three years. Every month, uh, the first Tuesday of the month, we have a, a, 
a highly successful entrepreneur come here and just talk about himself and his story. So to introduce, uh, uh, to kick off today's event and to introduce today's My Story speaker, Naveen. Let's give a big round of applause to Wayne. Chief Volunteer Officer, and uh, you know, just a joke I crack every time. So a few who might have been to this, uh, this or other events that uh, you know, San Jose Mercury News recently, you know, as yearly they they put a survey of all highly paid uh, you know CEOs and executives. And I was uh, joking with Bank last time. I said, looks like they missed your name because you also get paid seven-digit salary here at Thai. But the only thing is, is there is no one in the front, and it's all zeros. <laughs> So anyway, for that, at least we should give a big round of applause to him again. Thank you, Wayne. Um, because, like I said, he spends over 20 to 30 hours or even more, right? So, and then plus, uh, there's a very small staff here which kind of does all this. There's awesome food, the wine, to, um, you know, holding these events and reaching out to you guys to come and sign up. That's Raj, Kelsey, we have Terry and uh, Ramesh. Also, I saw something here. So let's give them a big round of applause. And uh, then to all the volunteers and all those who would be who are our aspiring volunteers for Tycon, to them also in advance, so you can sign up to be volunteers for Tycon. Okay, with, without that, uh, with that now, um, uh, how many of you are doing startups right now in the storage area? None. How many do you want to start? Since after listening to Kumar, I think you might. Want to jump into That's it? That's good. <laughs> okay. So, how do you create a leader in flash storage solutions with a flash platform that solves the challenges of poor application performance and redefines performance and storage in uh, data centers? So, this is what uh, Kumar and his team, in fact, his co founders are here. Uh, Raj, Raj is here, and Raj will be also coming in later on. Uh, they founded Verident in 2006, so they could help enterprises and service providers deploy public and private clouds, speeding up application response by an order of magnitude while scaling the server-side flash platform architecture. I got all the words right. <laughs> so Verident, anyway, enables enterprises to tackle performance-intensive applications uh, with PCI Based server, uh, PCI based server attached flash, enterprise flash storage for databases, analytics, virtualization, and other data intensive applications. And the company was acquired just a few months ago in September for over $685 million by HGST, which used to be for, which used to be Hitachi Stories, and it's a part of Western Digital now. And Kumar has over 20 years of experience as an executive, as well as an entrepreneur in the areas of storage, of course, DSP, wireless, and processors. Prior to founding um, Veritant, uh, he was founder and CTO of uh, VXTEL, uh, founded in late 90s and acquired by Intel in 2001. Uh, it was a developer of uh, VOIP, voice over IP, uh, DSP processors and subsystems. And then he was director of engineering as well as uh, part of the CTO team there at Intel for a number of years. And earlier in his career, he was a fellow at Connexent Corporation, which is based in uh, Southern California, and also a principal engineer at um, Rockwell, developing, if you remember, in those days, we used to have those modems, uh, 128 kilobit, whatever, we do not even think of kilobits these days. You want Mega, I guess, whatever. All right, so without taking too much of um, thrill from Kumar, I'd like to invite him to share his um, exciting, colorful, and amazing entrepreneurial journey, because he's a, I mean, he's one of the few entrepreneurs who successfully sold two companies over $400 million. So you can, you know, so he's here, try to get all the wisdom and recipe from him. So with that, let's give a big round of applause to Kumar. <laughs> Thank you, Naveen. Um, so, I don't know if, um, if I'm successful or not. I've been fortunate for the last 15 years. So, what uh, what I'll do is, uh, for about 30 minutes or 30, no, 30, 35 minutes, I'll run through some slides and pictures. Um, I want to thank you for taking time from your family this evening. Uh, I don't know if I'll be entertaining, but I'll try to be educational. Okay. 
questions. And feel free to ask questions. We can we'll be happy to answer anything I can. Anything hard, I'll give it to Raj and all the other people in the audience are smart of things. So, so let me let me jump in quickly. So um, as I started thinking about this, um, I sort of try to frame this in, in a couple of different areas. So. <coughs> So that's, uh, I try to put recent pictures when I'm happy. So that's a, that's a recent picture, and we don't want to see some of my other pictures. Uh, but uh, essentially, you know, I've gone associated with two, uh, fortunate with two startups so far, one called VXTEL. Um, we worked in the voice over IP industry, raised lots of money, uh, went through the, the NASDAQ bust, and still managed to end up at Intel and spent a few years at Intel. And then, um, Recently, uh, the last six years or so, six, seven years of being inverted, and that's where I'm going to focus most of my time on. And sort of uh, a constant theme, you know, when I think back, and this is some of the things uh, we try to use in our own companies to, to actually motivate people is um, a lot of the time when you start companies, uh, it's about speed, it's about how fast you can execute, you see opportunities in the market, and the enterprise space is um, very unique and different, and it's changing constantly. I'll try to highlight some of those as we go along. So I'll quickly touch upon sort of my, my two ex journeys so far. I'll try to contrast the two. Try to give you some idea of what, what prompted me to start these, what are the challenges, and hopefully try to give you one thing I've learned, you know, uh, something called pivoting, um, which is um, a fashionable word these days, but it's not really happy to do that. So. It takes a lot of emotional energy, it takes a lot of effort, and it's really trying to figure out how to take um, your core experiences, your technology, your team along to a new new journey that uh, will turn out to be successful over time. And that's that's where I'll spend most of my discussion on today. That's just uh, you know, my LinkedIn profile. Um, you see that. Background-wise, you know, I went the traditional route, graduated from IIT, 1987 batch. I think a bunch of you met me today. Um, went to UMass, Amherst, Massachusetts, and then went to Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Um, never imagined doing a startup in my life. Um, my dad was a doctor, and he was extremely worried how I'm going to be financially successful in life. So, but uh, push comes to shove, you know, we're, we was in a situation um, in Southern California at the time, and you know. Companies around me were started, and I knew Anurag Best was one of my co-founders from the first company here. We worked all over to Rockwell, and uh, we were seeing, um, you know, Broadcom getting started at that time in the early '90s, and we had opportunities to join them. And you know, we saw the development of the telecom market at that point. And I decided to take a plunge, uh, try to keep a job alive in case this thing goes down. So, uh, and that experience has really shaped uh, some of my thinking. And uh, I'll point to a couple of you know, transformative experiences in my life that helped me get there, right? This is, uh, this is my more recent profile. You know, I was a uh, I was a co-founder together with Raj Parekh here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about those uh, faces and names. Um, we are in the flash business. It's extremely flashy. A lot of, lot of money has gone in. Um, a lot of good outcomes are coming out. A lot of money will be lost as well. I'll talk to some of those, some of those things that's happening. Before that, I was at Intel, um, before that, VXTEL and Rock before that, right? And uh, for me, if I just step back, um, I think a couple of transformative experiences. I think uh, during the PhD profile, um, I had to spend a long time trying to get out and uh, convince my advisors to graduate me. So that uh, experience of working uh, and trying to cajole a group of people to graduate and being able to do something independent thinking has really shaped me in my companies, and that's uh, that's a that's been transformative in my life. <coughs> so let me let me quickly jump in. Uh, I'll give you some other headline news here. This is uh, a view of VXTEL. Uh, sorry, Anura, I couldn't get your picture quickly, so I had to create this in 20 minutes. So I had to cut and paste what I found on the web. But that's a picture of me over 10 years ago, a little bit more happy, a little less wrinkles. Uh, that's. Uh, the CEO, uh, Shri Dudani, who, was, uh, who joined the company a year and a half down the road, uh, the two investors, we raised over $80 million 
1999, 2000, you know, there was so much money, we were forced to take money from people, uh, very different timeline. Um, we focused on something called voice over IP. Um, the genesis really came, I worked at Rockwell Semiconductor, designing modem, voice band modems, I don't know how many of you remember it. I designed the first 56 kilobit modem for Rockwell, um, yeah. managed to be very successful, sold over 100 million units. Um, we talked to a lot of customers at that point who were using this for data, and the whole voice infrastructure and the convergence around that started uh, started coming into theme and play. And um, there's a couple of pivotal events that happened. You know, 1996, there was a big deregulation with the government, um, telecom deregulation, and that really opened up uh, something called competitive local exchange carriers, CLEX. Uh, 7,000 CLEX were created, lots of capital went in. Um, they had to have equipment. There was a lot of companies who were building equipment for these new generation networks. You know, how do you do conversion voice and data? And um, that's what we benefited from. The entire trend around how to convert voice on a packet infrastructure, how do you really create something unique uh, from a DSP processing as well as packet processing that achieved that. We got acquired by Intel uh, almost a year after the NASDAQ fell. Um, after the crash of NASDAQ in 2000, April, we got acquired a year later. Um, lots of uh, interesting uh, experiences at that time, but I think uh, to suffice it to say, we raised uh, uh, enough money to work, to carry over what we call the nuclear winter, right? There was, we, we expected four to six years of dry period, very hard to get exit, very hard to do anything else, and we had to raise enough money to create optionality. And that's what we did, and that created us negotiate, enabled us to negotiate better with Intel, who was also a strategic investor in the company. So that's uh, journey number one. Uh, it was uh, short, sweet, up and up to the right. Journey two, uh, where it end? Uh, this this time, um, so on Flash. Um, this was before Flash was sexy, before storage was sexy, but. Uh, Really, the genesis for this came, uh, I spent some time at Intel um, working in the CTO office. And um, Intel was starting to go into multi-cores. Um, we got lots of data around utilization of these CPUs. Uh, and Google was starting to put them into their infrastructure. And we were finding that the utilization of these uh, CPUs that were really very powerful were around 10, 15, 20% at most. And especially, you know, the world is moving towards data, we found out that a lot of these things are waiting for data most of the time. And you couldn't cache enough data, you couldn't process them fast enough and treat these CPUs to keep them busy. So we decided to focus on um, the other side of Intel, which is really around data infrastructure to feed the server farms. And really get, you know, that's part of the relationship we created with Intel as a strategic partner in this company. So. We went through, uh, Really many faces in the company, you know, Raj joined us. Uh, that's, a, that's a good picture of Raj, I think he was happy at those times. So this, uh, the, the one next to me is Vijay Karamcheri, who's a, who's a professor at NYU, he's a co-founder with me. Vijay and I did uh, uh, many years of graduate school together. So we spent uh, 10, 12 hours a day for three years, you know, staring at each other. So we decided that that relationship would work well in a startup as well. So he, he used to teach at NYU, then uh, convinced him to come to Google for a year just to really understand what Google is doing in this infrastructure. And that really is the, some of the foundation principles we try to use for Verden and how we went about Verden. Um, the, recently, you know, Raj was associated with us for the first uh, three, three and a half years or so, 2010. 2011, all right. Um, and uh, the last few years, uh, the gentleman there, you see Mike Kastas, and he's joined us in the last year. Um, he used to be at um, a CEO of a company called Blue Arc, the storage space, um, was acquired by HDS, Hitachi Data Systems. And now he's a part of Western Digital with us the, the last couple of months. So, Really, the, the theme for this company is around pretty simple. You know, we call this um, a drafting behind the mobile ecosystem at some level. So if you step back and think about it, um, what I watched at Intel was uh, over a period of 10 years um, with x86 CPUs, 
they could draft behind their 300 million consumer PCs that they were selling and build enterprise processors and really commoditize the risk of CPU ecosystem. So, started with MIPS and went to PA Risk, Sun, I, no, Itanium even is, is in trouble. And what they really did well was they took, they embraced open source, Linux was developing at the time, and they built enough performance for a $3,000 budget that every hyperscale, every every server company, that's the building block of the server. So they would they would define these dual socket servers, $3,000 price points, and really draft it behind their factories of 300 million PCs and the same factory, same architecture, same CPU, same efficiencies they could apply. So when we stepped back and looked at this company, we were trying to look at, you know, a larger ecosystem around the, the cell phone ecosystem. And if you look into a cell phone, but there's CPUs, which is not Intel so far, but it's ARM, ARM based, and there's memories and, uh, and storage. The memory happens to be something called NOR flash, for those of you technical here. It just happens to hold the code that runs the phone. And NAN flash is where the data is held. That's where you know memory sticks and USBs, and this is where most of the, when people talk about flash, more people refer to NAN flash. So we built a strategy around this where um, we wanted to pick our white space in this. Um, we started with NOR flash. This was unique, so differentiated. Uh, Fusion IO was another competitor to us at the same time frame. Um, they started with NAND, but we had much higher performance, much higher credibility in the market. We made a partnership with a company called Spiantion. A $4 billion company at that point selling North Flash, uh, spin out from AMD Fujitsu joint venture. Um, Raj had a deep relationship there. He was the CEO in the first few years of the company. He brought in, they invested. We co developed uh, many things with them. But uh, we really couldn't predict um, the 2008 meltdown. And uh, that's a key, key transformational event for us in the company. We were ahead. Um, these products got deployed. Uh, you know, we were in Facebook before Fusion Army got there. Uh, but long story short, um, expansion had to go through a bankruptcy <coughs> proceeding in 2009, and um, we were left to scramble at that point to figure out you know, how to survive as a company. And that's really our second chapter, and we had to do a couple of you know long shots or hail marys to survive, and we, we latched on to transform this around NAND flash. Um, three years after Fusion IO, or a year before they went public, I still managed to build enough value in the ecosystem together. So, a lot of my thoughts in the second half, I'll give you around what it means by pivoting for infrastructure companies. A lot of money, a lot of mass goes into it. So, pivoting is very hard. And how do you execute that? And some of the stories around that is what my experience the last few years. And then we had a happy ending. You know, two, two months ago, we were acquired by Western Digital. Um, Seagate was an investor in the company as well as strategic investor. And we had to collect uh, enough people, enough VCs, enough corporates to really support this mission to get ready to the market. Uh, I think I talked about all of this, uh, but I'll just give you a quick, you know, the triggers were for VX were around telecom deregulation. Um, Netscape IPO happened in 94. You know, lots of mania around, you know, internet is going to take over. In fact, Juniper, I think I met a bunch of people from Juniper, were started in 95 or 96, pretty close early on in those days. And 30, 40 companies in the terabit routing space. Everything was around moving bits, you know. There's a browser player, and how do you move bits in the infrastructure? And very optimistic environment, and our first uh, venture was around how to build best for bring DSP technology for that. The second one, you know, what I call social media and internet 2.0. Google became public 10 years later, 1994. Um, but this is our data now. So I just talked about how we drafted behind what we call the phone ecosystem or cell phone ecosystem. But this time it's a very pessimistic environment. Once the meltdown happened, um, very hard, um, especially for uh, you know, uh, turnaround scenarios to, to raise funding at that point. And we had to figure out how to survive with strategic partnerships. So two different experiences but it comes down to you know really predicting ahead of time when these market transitions will happen what these infrastructure needs are going to be and how do you get ahead of that you know it's, it's too late to start a company once you see three other players in the space 
and really the, the art form here, which uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I really fully understand, but it's really you've got to figure out how to start this few years ahead, try to predict some of these trends, and then try to keep an execution play out. So a little bit commercial around with it, and uh, we started in 2006. Um, we two, two centers, one here and one in Bangalore. We were forced to uh, uh, do that two, two split because of both hiring as well as capital efficiency. It's about 200 plus right now. Um, our products are called FlashMax. This is our hardware platform. Um, our software is called FlashMax Connect. And really the, the, the strategy here at a big picture level to simplify it is, if you look at how storage gets implemented, Traditional enterprises in the client server era. Um, I have a picture, maybe that may be helpful. Yeah, let me go to that picture and come back. Yeah. So if you look at the storage infrastructure, it's gone through three phases. You know, what we call mainframe, what we call server client, what we call cloud. And essentially, what's happened is, uh, you know, in the, in the middle phase, SANs were defined. NASA's were defined, that happened EMC premium pretty big, $40 billion kind of um, market down. And they are very profitable, very high margin growing very A lot of the server guys made a lot of acquisitions. You know, Dell, HP, Kinpar, trying to compete in the storage space. But now in the third third era, in the cloud phase, what happens is um, all the new generation companies, a lot of our customers, never buy a SAM before. They have done they're all young people, you know, who are in the late 30s, early 40s, building their infrastructure, all around servers. And this is really sparked around, you know, a new wave of thinking around how do you really build a large-scale, cloud-scale data centers to service. And that's where we focused. Um, uh, we have a little fun logo called No Spin. You know, we're trying to promote the flash and avoid spinning media. So we have lots of cute videos around this. But essentially, what we focused on is in the cloud era. How do you build large-scale data centers, and how do you provide a data platform that enables our customers to build a new generation of hardware? So, let me go back to one, and just give you a sense of what's happening. Right? This is a stack of the market. Uh, I have to make many pitches to VCs over the last three years, so I get to describe this in many different ways in every presentation. But Essentially, what you see on the left is a traditional storage market. You know, you see people like Western Digital and Seagate who build the media today, um, moves up the stack, gets wrapped around a storage array with lots of software, and you see EMC NetApp, uh, Veritas in that play, who created those enterprise SANs and NASAs, and it gets sold with data management software all the way to the enterprise. The uplift, what we call uplift, from the media to so the SAN is about 30, 40, 50 X. So there's a lot of the value is captured in the software, whereas the, the cost has been driven out through the media. And this has been kind of a core rationale for our acquisition as well. We're trying to redefine these value stacks in the industry, how storage gets deployed, how do we get, uh, with Flash, how do we redefine this value chain? If you see on the right, um, you'll see uh, lots of companies uh, who build the Flash. These are the NAND type guys. Samsung, Toshiba, we don't build the cloud. Then you have SSDs. You know, every client device has SSDs in it. You know, um, and Ultrabooks and MacBooks, all of them use SSDs. And you have the enterprise play, which is enterprise storage and enterprise SSDs in different form factors. And then what we straddle, or what we put in green is our play, you know, what we call the higher performance storage that's really tightly coupled into some of the enterprise data management features. So we're building these kinds of systems, really, that's delivered through a, through a subsystem or a module form factor through, through our OEMs to the end users that really captures the value around how do you build next generation data architecture or data storage architectures without backend SANs or without large scale storage equipment. So we're de defining this such that you get performance storage in the server side and capacity storage out in the cloud. That, that was a simple story, mission we set up, and we tried to do that. And by all count, this market is really exploding. Um, lots of players here, you know, 
over a billion dollars of HF funding has gone into flash storage in many different forms. Um, SSD companies, pure play storage, um, appliance companies. Um, the ones that, are uh, that have been in the public market are Fusion IO. They had a good ride for a few years. Now recently they've had their troubles. So we've got Violent Memory. I met somebody from Violent today. Um, yes, uh, they just went recently public. Um, we've got uh, a bunch of companies in the controller space that have been acquired. LSI acquired a company called Sandforce. Apple acquired a company called Anovid a few years ago. And recently we're done with Western Digital and uh, there's some rumors around Fusion IO getting acquired also in the next few quarters. So very active, pretty good exits. Um, we're really, re it's already defining how the next generation data platform is going to be from the storage standpoint, right? How do you, how do you really re redraw this interfaces, redraw the value chains? And some of these enterprises also are redefining themselves. You know, as you look at them, um, I was joking with Marvin today, you know, uh, in this company I've never worn a suit. I don't meet these guys. Enterprise guys are very different. They're all looking to cloud guys like Facebook and, and Google. Goldman actually consults uh, projects with Facebook directly. So they try to implement their same private cloud and scalable architecture back in their in the enterprise infrastructure. So very different conversations are going on. These guys are trying to figure out how to enable cloud, how do you build private clouds, and how do you really cut the cost of infrastructure by an order of bank. That's the, that's the focus for these guys. And they're going to figure out and experiment with technologies as long as it's safe for them to do so with trusted chains that they could do this. All right? Let me quickly flip through a few more. Um, I'll skip the technology details. This is a snapshot of some of our customers. Um, we managed to land a good subset of both uh, what we call hyperscale enterprise as well as solution partners. And strategic partnerships are core for us. You know, for us to get credibility with enterprises, an Intel partnership or an EMC partnership carries a lot of weight. When you walk in the door, these guys take you seriously. This is our new slide. You know, HGSC is the name of the company um, that officially acquired us. For those of you who may be confused, uh, uh, the hard drive ecosystem has got consolidated the last uh, five years or so. There's only two brands left, Seagate and Western Digital. HGST is Hitachi Global prior, prior to the prior life. They got acquired by Western Digital, but they have to be held separate due to some <coughs> MOFCOM Chinese regulations for the next few years. So they have two separate brands, HGST and Western Digital, one for client, one for enterprise. We really officially acquired around the HGST brand. And in the last uh, four months or so, they've spent over a billion dollars in acquiring three or four assets for them. You know, one is Verda. It's a company called Estec. Uh, it's been around for over 10, 12 years. The memory module business went into early fiber channel SSDs. One EMC as a customer went public and wrote <coughs> it down uh, when the EMC transition happened out of uh, Estec products. And then they acquired them, um, another company, was called Velabit, a small software team. And those three assets have been put together into cohesive strategy right now um, around uh, storage platforms as well as software that connects the people. All right, so let me spend a few minutes. Uh, what's the what's some of my experiences here? Um, and um, how do, you, how do we, you know, put some fancy words around this called pivot? But really, you know, how do you really look at where the situation is? How do you take it to the next step? Um, one of my friends in the venture ecosystem, uh, name is Adit, uh, he talks about the five Ps, passion, principles, partnership, persistence, and people. So I've added a sixth P called the pivot. So this is, uh, there's a picture of a guy called Eric Ries, if you guys Google him, you know, you'll find something called uh, Lean Startup and lots of books he's written around it. This uh, is fashionable now because you, know, you, you go figure out, you know, you don't know how to make money. So you run three or four trials to figure out how to make money and you call that a pivot. Um, infrastructure space is a lot harder. You know? Once you raise 80 to $100 million, uh, it becomes pretty hard to pivot at that point. And so really, for me, the word pivot means, you know, how do you really figure out uh, the ability to course correct in the middle of 
uh, execution in advanced market shares. Because you know it takes 18 to 24 months to build these products, and you got to really have worked through your set of uh, 360. You know, I'll talk about that. The founders 360, which all your different stakeholders have to buy into it. During the pivot. That's usually the hardest part of this. So I'll just flash a few slides. Our initial plan was something around NordFlash. Um, um, this was a really breakthrough at that point, a memory expansion system. Um, we built two ASICs, built the whole system, put the software, deployed it into customers. Um, and this was a joint development of very and expansion. So keep that in mind. And in, in my discussion, the next few slides, I'll try to give you some sense of you know what this means, right? Why did we pivot? And a lot of the these, these things are on when to pivot. Pivot or not, and how do you make that decision? And when do you pivot? You do it eagerly, you do it late. What do you pivot to, and how do you execute it with all the stakeholders? So for us, the, the choice of pivoting was pretty simple, right? Um, with the financial meltdown, um, our partner went into bankruptcy. We were single sourced on them. Um, they had uh, replaced the management team. They stopped making these products, and we were we were left with no choice but to figure out what else can we do. So for us, we define this to be you know how do we change our strategy and products without really changing our vision or or some of our core IP that we have built over. The, in the last three years. And uh, if you look at it, I'll come back to the slide, but it really comes down to what I call the 360 around you. Right? We've got certain customers, we've got partners, we've got investors who are already invested, we've got employees who are tired, who are um, you know disillusioned a little bit, and you gotta bring on new people as well as new management too change this course here. And we made a couple of key decisions at that time that really turned out to be, in hindsight, very helpful for us. Right? So it gets a little technical for some of you, but I'll give you a high level sense of this. Uh, we were competing with a company called Fusion IO. They are already over 125 million, 130 million when we start, decided to pay well. And by the time we brought a product out, they're already gone public. So what we decided to do was at that point, you know, we the market was moving to something called multi-level cell or MLC, which is a cheaper flash. And uh, we decided to go build a niche product called SLC, single level flash. And everybody questioned that decision, um, but we felt that that was the fastest way we could get credibility in the market. We had to get a product out, we had to get it into the customer's hand, we had to get it deployed, get some experience around it convince our next set of investors for it. So that established performance leadership, established time to market, we built the product within nine months from start to finish. Um, very critical, very critical. When you have to go through, you know, we had to re-raise all the money. So we, we, have, we had raised over $30 million for Series A, and we, we had to basically spend uh, three, three rounds, over, 80, over $100 million I raised over the next three rounds, we'll see every six to nine months. Because it, it takes a lot of uh, cash for these infrastructure companies. Uh, you have to, you know, hardware products are expensive, you gotta do calls, customers want free samples, you gotta build a team. And you don't get customers unless you have enough money in the bank. They, they don't wanna trust you for longevity. So raising money was a single focus, and for that we had to get credibility. So picking that product decision was a huge difference for us. If you picked MLC, we would have been, you know, at least a year, or a year and a half behind. Probably ran out of money. The second option was, you know, we had um, in hindsight. All this is great in hindsight, but uh, we had some options to exit the company, you know, much lower values, um, because you know we we were in a distressed situation, um, had a few months of runway left, and uh, we looked at some options, uh, uh, some offers on the table. Um, a less than $50 million range versus re-raising and redoing this. But uh, what we felt was collectively as a board, um, there's a lot more value in the technology and so we had to take the risk. And we had only you know three months of runway left in the company and we turned down an offer 
from one, one of the potential suitors, and we went and decided to actually do a different type of collaboration deal with another partner to actually go ahead with this. Um, that was a key decision in, in retrospect because uh, we built up a lot of value in the last two years acquiring customers with our technology, which were all left on the table. We took a cheap early. The third important decision that was more in the last year and a half or so was um, in order to slingshot and catch uh, our number one competitor, Fusion I, on the market, we had to get hardware credibility. We had to get into large enterprise accounts. Um, so we decided to, I had worked for Pat Gelsinger when I was at Intel, the CTO office. So I tried to cash in on that uh, relationship and we tried, created a sort of a difficult but a unique relationship with EMC. EMC is a is a big powerhouse in the storage space, huge credibility with customers. So just creating that hardware credibility with EMC improved our chances of success. From both financing, revenue, and customer mind share dramatically. <laughs> but at the same time, we knew that our exit options would be very limited because EMC wants us to be an outsourced development house for them at the end of the day for this technology. So we had to create an independent software strategy that they didn't like, but that was crucial for our exit to move up the value chain for us and create a thriving optionality so that we could create that options and we get down the road. So those would be the top three things I would tell you. you know, when we were doing it in the trenches, it was gut trenching, it was very difficult. Everybody doubts you. you know, it's usually very difficult with the board. Uh, I don't know how many of your board members uh, but well, typically my experience is, you know, it's, it's easy to judge in hindsight, but board members are um, difficult to go through that transformation process. They, they don't jump that easily. They're, once you're bitten, uh, it's very hard to convince them. So let me try and wrap up quickly. So from here, you know, I call this the Hail Mary. You know, we tried to buy up, uh, when expansion went under, we rebranded ourselves, tried to build uh, servers with our flash technology and resell it into the market. But that was short-lived uh, as we had really no supply continuity, no credibility, no, no way we could convince our customers for it. So really, this is some of the key points around the pivot. Um, we did a niche SLC product raised money from Sequoia, uh, we formed a partnership with Intel, uh, we brought in the, what I call the dream team, the Intel, EMC, and Cisco, sort of the number one in each of these spaces, <coughs> collected as a corporate consortium. And then we launched the real market bearing product, which we call MLC, which is 98% of the market today. Once you did that foundation, the next few years were pretty smooth or smoother. Um, Ray Series D, we brought in Mike Estes and the CEO, brought in investment from Seagate, and then recently got a quarter of So that's the journey. And um, I can put some fancy words around it, but there's an interesting book called Good to Great. I don't know how many of you have read it. And he talks about um, something called a stop tail paradox, right? Um, it's really a, a bimodal personality where you have to believe that it's going to succeed during the hardest time, and you have to ground yourself in reality at the same time. So, example, you know, we don't have cash more than a few months. We have to be able to believe and convince the largest partners, you know, Intel, EMC, Cisco, that we could do a partnership with them. We're gonna succeed on this. And convince them at the same time, we have to deal with the actual reality of what's going on in the ground. And convincing the people around you to believe this is even harder. So that's really, you know, what what was transformational here? I think for a few years we went through, you had to have faith, you had to take a lot of self, go through a lot of self doubt to get this over. But you had to go up in front and lead that transformation and convince the people around you to do this. And most of you know, you know, it's always around the perspiration, more than the inspiration. And this is just my family, you know, I, I can't thank enough. Uh, I'm saying somewhat alive because of the support of these guys, these three members, that's my wife, my son, my daughter. In fact, uh, 
on Sunday when I was watching one of the games, one Niners game today, she was the one, in these days in school, um, she, this is a presentation called Prezi, it's not PowerPoint, but it's very heavily animated in a canvas board, so she helped me create it in 20 minutes. So, she's 11 years old. Um, uh, thank you again for, for a great story, we really appreciate it. So uh, let me just ask a couple of questions and then uh, we'll open it to the audience. I'm sure they have a number of questions. And before that, let me just give a quick background on Raj also. Uh, a lot of you probably have know already about Raj. He's got a stellar background. In fact, there'll be an article published in January in Silicon India magazine, which he was very kind enough to spend a couple of hours with me to share his journey because he brings a unique, um, you know, a lot of unique experience with um, being CTO at Sun, as well as uh, one of the founding engineers at Silicon Graphics, as well as they were the general manager there, then founder of Redwood Ventures, and plus he's a prolific angel investor. So anyone looking for money, just grab him. <laughs> so that's what that, I had to get that story so that so I know so he feels good when you grab him say no 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 wait <laughs> and Raj is very good brutally honest he'll give you very good feedback so anyway we're really glad to have you also here and thank you Kumar for inviting him uh, so one question I'm going to ask you is I know you had two successes one after another and it's like you know um, and they really uh, they were not like bank salary so they had in the front at least single digits other than zero and even more bigger digits. Like, uh, so, you know, Reextel as well as Virinit. What do you think made it happen? I, I know you. But luck other than luck. They both started. That's with the easiest me. answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think the key thing was both of them started with me, so. <laughs> Sorry. 99% I know he's pushed by it. All right, sorry. Right. So, what is the question again? The question. <laughs> That's a good answer, huh? So, the question was you know, you are one of the few unique entrepreneurs who had two exits yeah. with, as I said, like on a higher, like, you know, first Intel uh, bought, first one was, I think, around 425 million, if I remember. 550. 550, yeah. Wow. In 2001, when everything was bust, I mean, really. You could see there were no cars on the Highway 101 at that time, I remember. And then the second one is our 685 million, where I know the story. A few years ago, you were again like you were perspiring really hard <laughs> at that time. I mean, you can share that anyway, you did some. So, what was one thing you think that made it happen for the time other than luck? Um, I would say still 99% perspiration and luck. But anyway, I'll give you some thoughts around this. But I think uh, what helped me was really predicting some of these trends before they happen. Um, in hindsight, I could put it together more. Um, we, we centered around unique technology. There has to be an IP barrier. Otherwise, it's hard to be much as hard to do enterprise companies. Once you have core IP, um, then it's around creating that, uh, that velocity and conviction around it, right? So. For us at VXTEL, we pivoted around, we focused on um, the whole carrier transformation in telecom. There's a big upgrade going on. And I was fortunate to see that a few years before it got crazy. And we casted this entire strategy around creating IP and DSP. And I pulled in on a rug into that and five other guys who, who joined me from Rockwell. Um, but essentially created the momentum around the customer attention was very high in those periods. Same thing for, for flash storage is uh, before you know, smart iPhones were there, smartphones were there, we kind of realized the trend um, that data is going to rule, decisions are going to be made around data, and creating a data platform is critical. And that's, those are the two kind of continuing thing, themes. I think how do you start, and how do you start early enough to, to see these trends is what I would tell you is okay. help me. And perspiration. Yeah, perspire a lot and sleep less. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so the second question would be, let me just ask Raj, um, in what do you think um, you are most proud of in terms of very I mean, we started Kumar and other founder Vijay, who will be here today, um, in terms of, you know, your time you spent with them. Well, the most important thing happened for the company in the beginning is that um, Kumar and Vijay were thinking about uh, doing uh, this particular type of company. 
and totally independently I was thinking about doing somewhat similar, not exactly same uh, type of company. When we all talk about it, we sort of kind of align with each other and say let's just do it. And that's how we started the company. And to me, the biggest issue was, the, the most important thing was that we did the company in a great way. Right off the shoot, we formed a business relationship with Spension. They gave us $17 million, um, some in loan and some in uh, investment and all of that. The VC, uh, Artiman, they have been supporting us from day one. And I mean, when you get some big company, big partnership already in place, obviously they will also invest. Uh, they asked lots of questions and they invested as well. So the company was doing fantastic. I thought I'm going to write a book, how to do a perfect company. Two years I was in that, okay, because everything was going on so beautifully. Then, as Kumar indicated, the disaster strike. And that's where the, uh, the, your question really comes into the play. When the disaster strike, we had a perfect product. Both Google and Facebook loved that product. They cannot tell the difference whether the data is coming from the DRAM or our flash. It was that good. We could have got nice uh, purchase orders from them but we could not supply because pension filed for bankruptcy on their own without, uh, you know, we had nothing to do with it, right? Now, I look at it and say, my product is dead. My team is already exhausted as Kumar also pointed out. And we have so much little money in the bank, there is no way we can do, make the company happen. But it was, Vijay uh, and Kumar's persistence was so good that we decided that somehow we are going to survive out of it. And what we did to survive and create the NAND-based product out, okay, we, have, we had less than $2 million left in the bank at that point in time. And uh, if I calculate, and I did calculate the expense, it was more than $5 million to get the product out. Okay, we did everything in the book, bagging, borrowing, stealing, whatever you can think of, and few things more. Many of the things Kumar is aware of it, some of the things Kumar is not even aware of it, because I wouldn't <laughs> tell him to get, otherwise he may get demotivated. Then, where do we take the company? So with that, somehow we survived. That's what I'm most proud of, that somehow we were able to create the product when it was actually considered not possible. We did that. And once that product was at least in a prototype phase and some a few customers were buying it, the investment from Sequoia, uh, other partnerships, everything came into the play. But that, if we would, uh, that was nearly impossible, but we, we were very fortunate and lucky to do it. And, and it was all about the support of the team. What do the, the, the job of the CEO and the founder is a very lonely job. What you tell them and what you don't tell them is extremely important. You never want to lie to your employees. But sometimes telling them too much actually distracts them. And then it does nobody any good. That's good. Thank you, Raj. Um, so one more question. Uh, so I'm going to, this will be more towards VXTEL. You have your co-founder here also. Um, so I think you can give him an opportunity to answer that as well. Um, since he's here, that means you're maintaining good relationship with your co-founder still. So that's a good thing. And you know, even Raj is here. So um, the question is, what are you both proud of when you, you kind of founded VXTEL? So you can answer first or you can answer. Maybe you try first. Huh? That's Anurag Vest, he is uh, his, uh, one of the co-founders, I guess. Yeah, in the group of five. Yeah. So, so I think uh, what we were most proud of was that before uh, we knew each other as co-founders, we were very good friends. So in, I think out of four or five, we actually, I mean, Kumar's son was brought, um, born in front of me. And so we knew each other well, and I still remember uh, the days, uh, six months before we started the company, we used to spend in his garage <laughs> trying to write some code or 
brainstorm and things like that. So I think I think for me, I think it's the most proud of is that in doing a startup is a very stressful job, and and we were I mean kids at that time. I mean we didn't. Uh, know how we will deal with stress and we fought a lot at some point <laughs> but after that I think we, we are working towards a single goal and I think uh, besides uh, doing a company and being lucky and being successful I think our personal relationships still remain the same so I think that's a good thing to be proud of. I think I echo the same. Um, I think the, the first experience was uh, very different, right? The, the macro market was positive when we were raising money, and I think the, the, the most difficult thing there was to, the most thing we were proud of is a group of five people, we were there, we added another five more, probably. We almost got to market um, within 12 months again. It was a race against time there also. And there, sort of, I describe it to our current client. We were the fusion IO, or we were the leaders in the market. We, we defined it. Um, in fact, I competed with uh, another company called Silicon Spice. Win Dong was the CEO of Silicon Spice, for those of you who know him. He had to go through a pivot as well. He had some issues in that company, but he ended up well also. So, so what we were proud of is we were really fast in execution. Execution is key. Credibility is key, especially in enterprise carrier place. No product, no discussion. That's what will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Kumar. Thank you, Anurag. Okay, we are going to open it to the audience. Uh, we need the uh, microphone. <coughs> Speak louder. So I have two questions. Uh, I come from the semiconductor industry. I am surprised at the choice of North Flash, given what you are doing. You you uh, got up to do. I mean, if I were you, I would start with an end flash, especially where this uh, yeah. the entire business plan, where the memory sits. My second question is, how are you coping with the read and write cycles of NAND flash today in your product, and what kind of guarantee you give to the customers? Okay. So, so we, the reason we started with NOR was we actually started the company not even thinking about doing the storage system. We were going to put a processor with the, in the DIM itself so that the search-like uh, algorithms can run a lot faster. Why transfer massive amount of data just for the search at the CPU? Why don't you uh, put a small CPU in the memory where the data is and just perform the search? Perfect way of doing it. And Vijay, uh, who spent time at uh, Google knew this thing very well. And for that reason, we needed the um, memory to work at the speed of DRAM. Within the memory cycle time, uh, DRAM's uh, cycle time, the data has to be there. Nor would provide almost within that time frame without violating the semiconductor spec. So we decided, that's why basically we decided to go with the NOR. <laughs> And the first uh, 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 tough decision I had to make is saying, no processor, let's just first put the memory, make it as a storage system, later on we will put the memory, uh, we will put the processor in the memory. So we started with that, and long behold, we never ended up putting the processor, right? But that's why we started with NOR, and it would give tremendous performance advantage over any kind of NAND whatsoever because it, it, it can do a command line read, okay, which would not be possible for NAND. So the read cycle, the faster. Yeah. Also, it was probably ahead in terms of in maturity cycle and cost. Right, and right, that. because it was al already used for the uh, program memory rather than uh, the data which, were, which can be corrupted type of mem uh, memory. Yeah. Essentially, it was more reliable at that time. Yeah. It was faster, 100 times faster than that. Yeah, just for audience sake, the read cycles are much faster than not flash, and uh, the write cycles are slow. I mean, just like this. Right, correct. Right. 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 It's like this. And so, so, my second question. Uh, the second question. Second question. So, I think well, this is around the program erase and then. Yeah, the number of cycles, read and write, and how you're coping, and what kind of guarantee you give to the customer. So, I think. Uh, we're handling it at multiple levels, and at a big picture level, um, we warranty this for three years, 
for or five years, extended warranty for five years, basic warranty for three years. What we do is we do, you have to use multiple tools to solve this. Right? You do error correction on the media level, over provision on the error correction level, so that you get additional coding gain. Then you go to the very module level correction, so you can replace faulty chips. And then you do a lot of it in software after that. How do you fail over across cards? How do you fail over across servers? So we dealt with it cohesively. Uh, the combination gave us uh, enough reliability. So we go into servers where our storage is um, five, ten times more reliable than the server itself. So when you look at the, the infrastructure, hyperscale guys are enterprises are deploying private cloud. Now 10,000 servers, 50,000 servers, uh, we are ten times more reliable than the server itself, which is the failure. Here. So for the people uh, who are not exactly into the semiconductor, the way I would say is that the memory itself is less reliable than the product we give, guarantee we give. How do you do that? If your fundamentally memory is not good, right? Or it is low, low, uh, low threshold. The way to do it is create the layers of software module and create many different pieces so that the reliability which the program sees is different from the physical bits. And that particular piece became extremely important for us, that software. It's a piece of the IP. Yeah. And, and that all happened in India. Next question. I would imagine that as you add more layers, you, know, you would be then sacrificing on speed, which was your uh, main bet. So how did you take care of both the assets. Uh, the layers of software you mean? Right. Yeah, so, but it came down to understanding, you know, this, the software is the server is a, is a, I put it nicely, it's a, it's a mess. The, the way these guys get deployed, right? Somebody builds an operating system, somebody else builds the application, and somebody else writes the driver for the, for the devices, and all these things have to cohesively integrate and work. So there's lots of opportunities. We created a driver stack that um, would give us um, the ability to intercept the stack at a much higher level, of, much closer to the application, if you will. That's the easiest way to put it. We still appear like a block device for those of you who storage savvy. We could put file systems on it so we can fight the file system for it, but we created enough efficiencies in the storage stack to get tied or close application aware for this. That's uh, part of Vijay's background, and you know, I was one of the co-founders created a lot of research around this. Um, how do you really create punch through stacks, and how do you create APIs for those? I take it you do a lot of error correction also. At the hardware level, yes. At the hardware level. Yes. So how do you think pretty technical here? Um, for a flash controller company, what does it take to survive against these vertically integrated companies like a Micron or a Hynix? that are also acquiring the controller capabilities. So you're talking about just pure play controllers? Right. So how do they survive against companies that have their own DRAM and their own land? Uh, well, Seems like a IEEE session here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Flash controller. So depends on which, so for the enterprise market, the volumes are much lower. So a controller company can find it very hard to make money for purely focused on the enterprise space. At a silicon level, you make $1,500 per silicon. The volumes are not, it's gonna be million, 10 million servers are sold every year. So if you take $50 per, every server you get one, one piece of silicon in, that's not still that much, right? Total damn was. So you gotta go on the client side. And client, the vertically integrated guys are gonna kill you on cost, so it's pretty hard. Um, the only successful companies are like Sandforce, who got acquired by LSI. Um, they were at a unique time, unless I needed that technology for, for the client, we target the enterprise. Um, it's pretty hard to create a new silicon play for the enterprise alone. There's a lot of innovation opportunities, but the, the margins and the profiles don't work out financially. So I had a non-technical question that's triggered by Raj's, Raj's mark, right? So he said that most of the software innovation was done in India, right? So, so this may not be a bit and specific question, but uh, logistically and operationally, so how do you protect the IP that's being developed across here and there? I mean, was that an issue or what's the trick to doing that right? 
Um, I think it comes down to, uh, we didn't do anything special, we just answered your question. We hired a bunch of people, we worked with in the beginning. So part of the challenge with India is, um, and this is something I'm learning, this is my second venture that, again, you know, we did in the cross-border, India, US. Um, in the early parts, when you're building a product, I actually think it's better to co-locate people if you can, because a lot of the things are hard to write down. Uh, you can't have a conversation exactly 12, 12 and a half hours away and try to be coherent. Somebody is sleeping a lot of times. So it's kind of hard to convey that. But we took on the challenge because of capital efficiency reasons. But overall for India, I would say the IP protection was around hiring trusted employees. That people who had worked here, who moved back, or around which we seeded the whole thing. So basically hire a few pillars, right? I mean, people who work, who you have a good relationship with, Cisco or Jennifer or whoever wants to go back for personal reasons and we see that the team around them. And we could communicate with them efficiently for the early part of the development. Um, it's a little, little different when you go to China or other places in the globe. The IP, IP issues are much harder. But we implemented standard policies around, you know, um, you know sanitizing the code and firewalling it. And you have to trust people ultimately. There's very little options. And we had an interesting piece behind it, uh, on top of it, that uh, the software will only work on our hardware, which was all done in US. So even if people steal a piece of code, I don't know what they can do. So it was interesting. Yeah, we would be flattered if somebody stole our code and started to sell it also. I think with the, the three companies, Samsung, and then you have Toshiba, uh, Sandisk, and then you have Micron. Right. And, uh, Everything, everybody doing proprietary, including the flash controller. So if you guys want a dissertation, I can give you. What do you know about the I Intel the Micron effort and some of the things they are doing can in this area? Since you can there. they give opportunity to do it with someone else and we'll come back to you? I know, otherwise you can just have the whole session. <laughs> <laughs> come on, then we'll come back. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, actually, my question has nothing to do with storage, I guess, but uh, really understanding the pivot that you did, or the pivot that you did build and where there was already a market sort of leader and what was the thought process, right? Because you're, you know, somebody's generating 100 million, you know, you have some IP. Uh, how did you convince yourself that, you know, there's sort of a, enough of an opportunity here to, uh, you know, continue on and, and compete and then, you know, win in that marketplace? And the second sub question really would be that in both, I think, exits, you, uh, I don't know the period and revenue, but I think, if I remember right, I think the multiple was pretty high. And uh, you had a bunch of, you know, other strategic investors, et cetera, you know. Um, you know, how did that play out or kind of what was the you know, thought process there? But more importantly, in the pivot side, uh, how did you sort of convince yourself that you would take on a, you know, a fairly fast growing company and, and uh, you know, win? Yeah, I can take the first one. Follow up and add more. Yeah. So with Fusion IO, we knew that they are essentially looking at NAND or they are looking at the SATA SAS kind of a SSD upping to the PCI level, so much faster version and all of that. Since we came from NOR, which was order of magnitude better, we came down while they were trying to go up. So in that equation, we found that their climb will be slow enough so that if we are coming from top down, and if we can go fast enough, uh, we will have a room. And fast, we had to do because we did not have money to, uh, to be slow. So without the, because of the lack of money, because we are coming from top down, reusing our IP as much as possible, uh, that's why uh, it, second pivot worked for us. Yeah, so I, I think the way uh, I would describe it, the market is pretty big. We're, we're in the first or second inning even today, the entire storage transformation out there. Storage is a 30 billion, 40 billion dollar per year market talking about a few billion, a few billion dollars of performance storage right now. Um, so we felt, yes, Fusion IO was ahead, but we had to bet on a few things. We understood our core technology was fundamentally better, as Raj described. We were dragging our performance down from much higher levels, and we defined a vision of software, the next step behind it. How do you really collect and aggregate these devices into useful storage? How do you disrupt the value chain in this? And that's what we kept in our minds constantly while we were executing. Even though we did the hardware, it was a carrier vehicle to drive our value proposition of software. That really drove into the 
into the fundraising and the exit system. I have, I have a quick question. Uh, your current data rates, are they PCI Gen 3 rates or Gen 2 or? They are going to be Gen 3 by, they're right now Gen 2 physically, the interfaces are Gen 2. Um, they are 3, 4, 3 gigabytes per second uh, bandwidth, you know, they're pretty fast. Uh, we hit over a million IOPS on small blocks. So to give you guys a sense of this, a standard hard drive, it's 250 IOPS, random IOPS. Okay? One of our cards is a million IOPS. So we're, we're equivalent of 5,000 hard drives from a capability standpoint. That's the big disruption. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the net of flash. Our IPs are on how to make that usable from an enterprise context and how we scale. Can you define PCI for the non-techies in the audience? I know it's, just want to make sure Something that goes, out here. <laughs> that goes into a server that's inside the server, as opposed to sitting in the network. That's the e easy definition to see. It's, it's a standard that's defined by Intel. It's an open standard. Um, it's an adapter, usually. People build adapters, and NVIDIA builds graphics cards to put into these slots and servers. What does it really stand for? Yeah. Peripheral, peripheral the, Connect Interface. Connect. PCI, the bus. The bus. It's, it's trying to wake up some of the people who are just, oh, this stuff is going yeah, to Yeah, it's getting pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can come back to your question now, since. So, what do you know about the effort of uh, Intel and Micron in the, both in the client as well as enterprise uh, server side, some of the effort they are doing, and how does that compete with uh, what you have done? I think it's not just Intel and Micron. All the NAND memory now, the whole transition to flash, gives the NAND fab guys who own the fabs a big cost advantage, fundamentally, right? Like they own the NAND, they can avoid the margins in the stack, and they can integrate it out. So everybody to race, everybody's trying to create SSDs or hardware products. For them, moving from component to hard drives, but drives is good enough step for them. I think our step is really to move up the stack. So we're trying to, try to redefine the storage architecture. We'll use these drives together with them. Uh, what we build and what others build even over time. So what you will see is a lot of these guys and NAND guys have to focus on client. That's where the volumes are for them. And Intel sells over a billion dollars of SATA drives to the client market. And Micron will do the same. So the, the JVs are established for, for NAND manufacturing but they're going to redefine how they think about going to enterprise. It's a, it's a different beast of enterprise. Mick? So, you know, just following up on uh, this uh, Cisco's acquisition of Hiptail, yeah, and uh, that brings uh, storage closer to computing. Uh, is that a trend? Is there, are there opportunities uh, more? Uh, that's one question. The second, in general, uh, what other areas in storage, do you see opportunities easy for uh, entrepreneurs? Okay. Um, on the Webtail is an indicator. What you're going to find is at a big picture level, storage is getting redefined. Um, you don't need to stripe data across thousands of hard drives to create performance from storage arrays. You can use Flash. It's dense. It's cheap. It's getting cheaper rather, and it's getting fast enough. So lots of flash deployments are happening. And that's where you know the compute element storage, all the server companies are going to recreate their storage value through that mainstream strategy. They have to go acquire companies. Now, HP had to acquire three part and so on to move up the stack. But now the sort of the play is coming to them. It's coming to their turf where they own HP owns fifty five percent of the server market. Now they can create a unique strategy around flash that goes into the server directly. Yeah, it's their playing field. So you're going to see that happen. That's why Cisco's acquisition of Hiptail makes sense. We're going to create products that get bundled and sold together as um, servers and Cisco using the strategies gets enhanced with that. And you'll see a couple more exits like that coming up, I think. Um, I think uh, in terms of going forward, opportunities are going to be plentiful in the storage space, but they're going to be higher up in the stack. Uh, hard to create silicon controller companies uh, at this stage. Unless you have something unique or something special compared to the partner, unique situation. Um, 
still the use of flash how we create um, it redefines the entire stack. You know, once you put flash into the medium, you're dealing with how do you manage storage, but the data lifecycle management is going to change next. Um, how do you connect to the cloud? You know, so there's lots of innovations here. Uh, enterprises are used to file system. People are going to move something called object storage over time. There's an interplay with something called OpenStack that's coming up, uh, which is a redefined stack to create a private cloud that's all open. So. It's definitely a, a play for the software infrastructure companies, storage software companies. And you'll see there was already 20, 30 investments in the last year who've gone into this already. So I think that's rich. That's a good place to look. They'll have maturity time for the next few years. Um, and uh, I think there'll be a, a bunch of exits there. To, uh, to answer your uh, basically second point, uh, the software defined data center is all over and the software defined data center disassociates where the processing is and where the storage is and you can reconfigure it anytime so there is a layer in the middle so that is the that's where the pendulum is going that disassociate everything from each other when that happens the entrepreneur need to look at exactly opposite end because that pendulum will go too far in that area and everything will be so disassociated and the performance penalty will be there because of the, the disassociation so how to do an integrated version will become something of future but not today today it is software define everything you know if i am not careful this may become software defined <laughs> so so that's where it is going. You cannot fight against the trend, but the entrepreneur has to find out the other trend. You can call it software defined disassociation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there's a question. Hello, uh, Kumar and Raji. Thank you so much for your uh, amazing story. It's uh, really wonderful to hear that you had only three months left with money in the bank and uh, you had an offer on the table, but you persisted and went forward to make this amazing exit uh, come, to, come true to life. So real nice to hear the story, and uh, I was wondering if you could share some lessons of how you pull off a project which was budgeted for five million in about less than half the money. Um, what was the trick? How did you do it? What were the deals that uh, you suddenly made happen for this to happen to come to fruition? It was more than five million. Uh, yeah, it's more than five. But I think Raj does all the tricks for that. <laughs> uh, I didn't pay salaries. Well, um, I. I, I I don't think I can go over all of them, but let me just tell you uh, a couple of them. Of course, you manage the money going out, right? So practically the whole company was paid minimum wages. Now, hardly they can buy the groceries in some cases. So we made some exceptions and uh, paid some, some of the people more. But how do you keep them motivated when your major project fail? It is uh, already there is a demotivation going on. So more, bigger issue is not money; it is the mindset of the people. That was a, uh, that is the one thing. Second thing is um, um, uh, again this is the part Kumar doesn't know. At some point in time, I had to actually give a personal guarantee to some other people. To in order to make sure that just in case I need money, the money will become available. Okay, I, I did not want it to even go to the board for that. I would give personal guarantee. Okay, we, which we never exercise, so it never happened. So it uh, support us. I, I had everyone. to do that after you left. Off. Yeah. So one rule is you have to have a sugar daddy in the company. Well, uh, not necessarily, but uh, sugar you, daddy, you, you, daddy. what I'm trying to tell you is that you try to find every which uh, which way you can, but you just don't give up. Okay, that that particular passion, and there are the few other tricks which I did. Uh, so uh, offline, I may tell you, but, uh, but not. <laughs> no, but actually, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more uh, different answer. Product-wise, we built everything on FPGAs. You know, we were doing ASICs before. Um, you're going to find that it's hard to accept that because cost-wise, it's different. You know, time to market will be faster, but ASPs are higher, so you're forced to define your value exactly at a higher cost platform. But that was a critical decision we made. Even today, we build all our products as an based on FPGA, but we don't build any silicon anymore. Cuts out, you know, a lot of your budget quickly. So those strategies, you have to embrace them. You're going to find very hard pushbacks, but it will force you to really redefine your core value. 
So, Kumar, what's next? Lots of meetings and rest of the for a while. So. Uh, I'm going to look, I think I have some interesting things in the storage space, but uh, I may go to a different area. There's, there's a lot, I think Bank also asked a question. Or, there's a lot of activity in big data. It's, it's hype. We have to wait for it to cool down a little. Maybe there's some, there's opportunities there, but I think there's too much buzz going on right now. So, um, I'm really trying to figure out what to do next. I don't have good answers. So I can talk to you maybe after we should figure out. But essentially, I think I, I, all I know is how to do companies. So I'll probably keep doing them for a while till nobody wants me to do it or I can't do it. Until he has a shining head. OK, another question? All right. So you've both mentioned a couple of times that you had um, employees um, out of the country, and I just wanted to ask you more specifically, as a startup, do you feel that you faced struggles as far as like um, with dealing with immigration policies and dealing with hiring processes and things like that? Yeah, we actually, immigration wasn't a big issue for us, simply because we had a team in India and we only bring them here on an as needed basis, not as a permanent employee, so that wasn't the issue for us. Um, Another question? <laughs> Jane wants us to start. Anyway, so. Um, any, uh, I know you, can you define it more specifically? Let's say if you, someone wants to start, I know you can't start since you have to still be there West Indies, or maybe you can just give really more specific to Wang, probably he might get started again with a company. <laughs> An example. I mean, like an area, like more narrow down focused. Today, let's say you had the opportunity to say, okay, let's start tomorrow and I'm really excited about it. So what would that be? Well, there are some specific point plays in the storage software stack. I think there's opportunities there, definitely. Uh, OpenStack is one thing I'll tell you. A lot of it, customers are interested in integration into OpenStack and something specific, creating new storage value out of that would be interesting. Software defined X is a buzz, but there, I think specifically if you drill down, how do you do hybrid clouds? How do you connect both on-premise and off-premise in a proper way with software? Mediation will be interesting. I mean, those, those I see a lot of demand for from customers. Big data will be there, um, but uh, I think there's a lot of hype there, and you really have to think different. You know, I think you have to think um, exabytes of data. I mean, most enterprises have over 50 petabytes already. So, fast forward a few years, we have exabytes of data. You can't move it anymore. How do you manage it? How do you define it? How do you access it? How do you turn it around? do meaningful things for enterprises and create business platforms. So there's a couple of couple of thoughts there, but you gotta define a core IP around that. Then you can stick to so. Raj, do you have any thoughts? Some nuggets for the entrepreneurs yeah. yeah. in the yeah. audience? Actually I agree with uh, uh, what Kumar just mentioned. Data will become too big to move. So now you have to think about how you're going to move compute or your application or your, um, forget data, forget application, forget everything. It's about tasks. You need some tasks to be managed. And you move data or you move processor, what do you move where in order to get the task done? Um, uh, yeah. um, just one last question, I'm sorry. To, uh, uh, what's your take on the traditional storage, I mean, network attached base like SAN or NAS? Uh, do you think that still compute exists? Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. The people are buying, it's pretty big. It's big. The growth will get slowed down. The most profitable parts of those will get eaten up by flash, what, the performance part of it. Okay. So, obviously, uh, they make all flash storage. Right. I mean, like either SAN or Many that. ways to do this, right? I mean, what traditional guys are doing is they put SSDs into their arrays. EMC does that as something called FAST, and they rebrand it and sell it in a pot. Some SSDs, some HDDs in it. You can do all flash arrays, you know. Uh, Wildman did that. Uh, a lot of companies are in that space, 30, 40 companies. 
or you can do it on the server side and aggregate them into a, a flash virtual set. So those are the three options and you'll see you know, all diversity exists for one. Especially the way the density of the flash is increasing, the rate at which it's increasing the cost. Yeah. So that's going to become a very key factor. Yeah, it's called Moore's Law of Storage. That's what we define it. Yeah, especially multiple levels of uh, the, how they can put it on the same chip now. So let me ask one more uh, last question. Uh, in the meantime, or okay. Uh, you talk about your views of object storage. Where do you think it's going? I think it's very hard. Um, I think the definition of how do you access it um, is going to become important. There's a thing called CEPH, C -E -P -H, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's a way, it's an open source way of creating object stores, large scale object stores. Uh, but there are some fundamental limits. You know, when you talk about exabytes, you talk about exabytes of data, that's what you got to shoot for next. Um, traditional access mechanisms fail in a lot of ways. And you've got to rethink how you're going to access it, how you're going to index it, how you're going to store it, how you're going to manage. That's where in the object-based area there's a lot of opportunities. And there's a new word that uh, people are calling cold storage, you know, so cold means, you know, how do you, flash is for hard, cold is rarely accessed. But uh, it makes sense to put flash into a cold storage area as well. So that's another area that I think the specific IPs that can be created and exist can be created in the next few years, cold storage. So uh, the question was around um, your uh, VC investors. So how was your experience? I know the first time I think things went almost flying up. Second time you went through your roller coaster. So how was the experience with the VCs? First year and then projects again. Well, the VCs uh, did fine. Okay, let me put it that way. No, no, it's your experience. I'm saying as co-founders, your experience, not. Oh, my experience. I mean, both of you went like as a co-founder, and they didn't because obviously it went through its kind of you know like up and down period. So how was the experience dealing with them? All right, I may have to go back to the meetings. I should say nice things. So. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think there. Hide your face in the video. We're just gonna put that. The kid is not visible. <laughs> so, part of you know, part of when it an early stage is uh, you know, Raj was Raj and the three of us. We thought about how do we create the leverage without going too much money, without too much VCs. You know, because we wanted the ability to control the destiny in some way, find a white space and grow it. But. Um, my experience is overall overall positive. There's always bumps in the road with your board and with the specific investors on which way to go and so on. The, the simple advice I'll tell you is, you know, never have just one VC, have always more than one. It changes the dynamics on the board. Having three, maybe four is the right right range. You know, twenty million dollars per investor would be the right range. Uh, that's got lots of implications when you have to pivot, when you have to change, you know. You exploit the crowd phenomena at that point. You're not, you're not in one, one person's control. So that that matters, and I think overall they have the money at the right place. It's easy. It's one spot to convince them, and um, I, I, overall positive. So Raj, I know you have been on the both sides of the planet, <coughs> but here it's more as a co-founder. Let's say you've never, you've never been as an investor, so that would be interesting to hear your views on that. Yeah. So uh, when the first product failed and we were running out of money. We had one VC and <clears throat> I did went to the VC and say, hey, I need more money to actually do second product. And um, why, uh, they were very supportive of us throughout the time. Nevertheless, the answer was, Raj, we know somehow you can deliver a product, so go do it. And uh, when I came back from that particular meeting, I said, oh my gosh, uh, I cannot just go and get the money. You know, although I know these people so well and everything, they are finally making the financial decision uh, for their own LPs. So I just have to somehow deliver it. So yes, uh, to me, the experience uh, with the VC was very good. Managing pivot was very difficult. Um, but uh, 
uh, you know, we can talk all day long because we were successful, okay? But I can also assure you that probably eight out of 10 companies would not be able to go through that, that kind of a reward. Yeah, in the end, but at that time when you were going yeah. through that time, obviously there were a lot of uncertainties. Absolutely. Right, Absolutely. right now, of course, in the height. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we were worried whether next month we'll be able to pay or not. But I'm, uh, at the end, uh, one thing I do need to say uh, is I really like to thank Kumar uh, because the exit of this company has a lot to do with it. What happened was, Fusion IO did well in the market. They became a darling of the industry, a new way of doing it. They may become an EMC of tomorrow, all kind of different things. So they were completely on the hype. And Violin was coming to the market. The last round of funding they had done was already at 700 plus million valuation, things that from SAP and others. So they were coming with a big expectation to be a couple of billion dollars market cap type of a company. So when that was happening with the two big giants in the middle, Meriden just exited, taken the cash off the table. And while other two guys are still fighting, you know, that how much money they can make. Today, Violin unfortunately is uh, less, uh, just about half the last uh, private round of funding. One of my friend actually invested uh, in that company and not exactly happy. But nevertheless, two big giants were playing the financial game in that process right in the middle. Kumar and the team somehow managed the exit of the company. So congratulations and thank you. <laughs> that was going to be my question that when you, I mean, it seemed like you had a very good list of customers, so why exit it? But I think you answered it. So I think it was the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. And last question, anyone? Okay, all right. So we are going to adjourn the session. Let's give a big round of applause to Kumar. Da 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 da